Um, but if, uh, if you don't know me, my name's David. I am on staff here at Severn. And um, today we are continuing our series. We're actually ending our series called Uncommon Good, where we've been, uh, for the past uh, three weeks, this is the fourth week, we've been looking at uh, what it means to, to really serve like Jesus has called us to serve. And uh, we've looked at kind of just the general call that Jesus um, has on us as far as God's people, the general call for us to serve. We've looked at the specific way we can do that in our workplaces. We've looked at how we can love our neighbors and serve our neighbors. And today, to end the series, we're actually going to look at what it means uh, to serve your church. Now, when I say the word serve your church, if I had to guess, many of your minds, many of our minds, t- naturally go to, you know, thinking like, oh, no, you know, they're short on kids volunteers again, or they need another host team member, or more worship team members. And, uh, and I think um, whenever, we, whenever we think that way, it kind of reveals a way that our minds tend to naturally go when we hear the word church in America, and, and that's that we think of church often more as a place that we go to, um, as opposed to a people that we're a part of. Um, so uh, I'm not going to guilt you into joining our Sunday morning serve teams today, in case you're wondering. Um, my goal today is actually to talk about, um, first, what it means to be part of a church, kind of just look at that for a little bit, and then we're going to look at some practical ways that you can uh, both discover your gifts and what you bring to the table and also how to use those in the context of a local church, um, and then we're going to talk about um, the better way, the better way for us to serve um, as a church. And to do this, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, And I'm going to read verses 12 uh, through 31, and and we'll just kind of be in this passage today. So I'll go ahead and and read this for us. This is starting in verse 12. For as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed each one of the parts in one body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? Now there are many parts, yet one body. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. But even more, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. And those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have a better presentation. But our presentable parts have no need of clothing. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you were the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has placed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, managing, various kinds of languages. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in other languages? Do all interpret? But desire their greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. So, uh, the first thing we're going to look at today is just briefly look at what it really means to be part of a church. And here in 1 Corinthians, really the first thing we can see is that, you know, anyone who's a follower of Jesus uh, is part of the church, and that's likened to uh, the body of Christ. Which, when you really think about that, and when you think of all the the implications of what it means to be the body of Christ, it's a pretty incredible thing. Uh, But the specific passage we're in, the topic that, that the Apostle Paul was talking about was the idea of, of gifting, of spiritual gifts and of building up the body and the different roles that each person plays. And we see this, this real beautiful um, just diversity in the body as well as a beautiful unity that's described here and how every part has a part to play just like in a human body. Um, and whereas any time that anyone who's ever put their faith in Jesus is part of the universal church, Uh, Today, we're going to spend time kind of focusing on what it means to be part of a local body, of a local church. We're going to kind of narrow our focus, and, you know, this was a letter written to a local church in in a place called Corinth, so we're going to focus on that today. And the first thing we see in this passage about what it means to be part of a local church, it's our first main idea today. It's number one, that you are essential. And I'm going to read this uh, again just right out of verses 15 through 20, which is where we see this. It says, 
If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed each one of the parts in one body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? Now there are many parts, yet one body. So what we see here in this idea that each one of us is essential is that whether you or I realize it or not, or whether we feel like it or not, each and every one of us has a vital role to play in a, part, in a local church, as part of a local church. And you see, this, this letter, again, 1 Corinthians, was written to a church in a place called Corinth by the Apostle Paul, and he was responding to a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of things they'd asked him about. So clearly, you can, and apparently, there were some issues in that church where some people felt less than, or some people didn't feel essential. You know, they felt like either they weren't gifted in the way that they should have been or didn't have a, a special enough gift, and they felt like they weren't important. And it's really easy for you and I to feel that, that same way, too. You know, we can think, you know, I'm, I'm just a hand. You know, I'm not gifted that way, so, so I don't have a role to play. But Paul's response to that is very simply, he's like, no, the church needs you. Every part is important. And when you think of this in the context of a, you know, a human body, it makes a lot of sense. For example, the, the human brain is a really amazing thing. You know, scientists are still baffled by it. It's actually, I think it's kind of humorous when you, you see scientists confusing their brains while they use their brains to study their brains. I think it's just kind of a funny thing. Like, humans are the only species that's ever done that. But uh, needless to say, it's still a mystery in a lot of ways. There's still a lot of things we don't know about the human brain. It's this amazing thing. But if you are hungry, your brain cannot pick up a sandwich and move it to your mouth. It can't do that. A hand does that. And an elbow is essential in that. I was thinking, I was telling the 9 a.m., I was thinking this week about stuff that I wouldn't normally think about, like how hard it would be to eat a sandwich without an elbow. (laughs) You know, like, anyways, try that later today. Tell me how it goes. Anyways, so your hand and your elbow are are essential to that. And your your brain can't chew a a sandwich. You know, you need teeth and a jaw. And, you know, your brain can't digest the food. And I'll I'll stop there because, you know, I don't want to have digestion jokes floating around here today. So, um, but needless to say, as amazing as the brain is, without the other parts of the body, it would die. It wouldn't be able to function. It wouldn't be able to do anything. And the same is true for a local church, is that every single part is vital. And not only are you gifted in a specific way, if you're a follower of Jesus, are you gifted in a specific way to build up the body, but you're also placed exactly where you should be, is what we just read in 1 Corinthians 12. And uh, this idea, you know, this idea that uh, you're unique, you're gifted in a specific way, you have a specific purpose, uh, this is an idea that I think as Americans we can get behind. We're like, all right, yeah, I like that. You know, like I'm unique, I'm special, I've got a role to play. And it's actually pretty nice whenever something we read in the Bible is easier for us to hear because of where we live or the time we live in. And obviously we're, we're maybe overly focused on individualism in America. But here's a point where the Bible is saying, no, you are unique. God is saying you do have a special role to play. And that's really nice when that happens. But for every time that happens... There's at least another time in the Bible where it's going to come up against you and kind of rub you the wrong way. And maybe it's going to be different than the way we naturally think or the way we want to think. Um, That actually brings me to the second thing we see in this passage about what it means to be part of a church. And that's number two, that that we are interdependent. So as Americans, we like to be independent. That's a different word. (laughs) Interdependent means not only does this community need you, but you need this community. And uh, and we see this in verses 21 through uh, 26, which I'll go ahead and read that again for us. It says, so the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. But even more, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. And those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have a better presentation. But our presentable parts have no need of clothing. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So really what we're seeing here is that if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, the church really is your primary community. These are your people. This is really your, your primary community. And this is something that can sometimes rub us the wrong way, at least nowadays or in the American church, because it really doesn't jive to be a follower of Jesus and to say that you 
don't need other believers or other followers of Jesus. And it's, it's pretty common, or at least it has been, to say that so, you know, I love the church, I, I love Jesus, I just hate the church. It's often a, kind of a, a sentiment or a mindset we can carry around where it's like, I love Jesus, not a fan of the church, though. Or, you know, just when you think about that, when you think about the way God has called us to live, it's actually incompatible to try to, to live the way God has called us to live outside the context of a close-knit church, of a, of a local body of, of Christ. <clears throat> and uh, I, I do want to say I, I recognize the challenges that we face when it comes to, you know, anything that's organized or any kind of institution. Um, I recognize the challenges we face when it comes to trusting ourselves, like to a, a spiritual leadership, actually submitting to spiritual leadership. That's not something that we, that we naturally get excited about. And I understand the, the anger and the pain that has been caused by, by sin in local churches. It's, it's rare to come across someone who hasn't been affected by that, who hasn't been wronged by someone in leadership or by a local church. But while all these challenges are, are valid and are things that maybe should make us proceed with caution when, when looking into a local church, they're not an excuse to avoid one another or to keep other Christians at an arm's length. Because again, as a Christian, our primary community is the church. And that's going to be played out in a local body of believers. And it requires, you know, it requires a commitment, obviously. It's something that a commitment is a word that we don't necessarily like nowadays. You know, even phone companies are onto that. You notice there's no more two-year programs. It's just we don't like commitment. So that's what it's going to take. And this is something that doesn't, you know, we're interdependent. We don't necessarily like that, but it's what it means to be part of a local church. So just kind of in a, a nutshell or in a summary of the two pieces we can see there about what it means to be part of a church is that you know, you're, you're an essential part of this community called the church. And this is clearly only kind of a brief overview, uh, you know, of what we see here in, in 1 Corinthians 12 regarding that idea. But, but we see that it, it's so much more than this idea of just, you know, a, a one-hour gathering on Sunday morning. Because you see this closeness described where if one member suffers, everyone suffers with them. And if one person is honored, everyone rejoices with them. You can't build that kind of closeness at a one-hour gathering. You just can't do that. You know, it's something where to even know what someone else's suffering is, you have to have a certain kind of relationship with them. But then to actually genuinely suffer with them because you love them so much, that's a whole other level of closeness. So it's a commitment, it's a closeness, and it's so much more than a one-hour gathering. And the reason this is important to talk about before going into, you know, practical ways to serve and in and with the church is because when we only think of it as a gathering on the weekend, we severely limit ourselves and we really pigeonhole ourselves in what it would look like to serve the church. We kind of like squelch our imagination because it's just, you know, joining one of the teams on a Sunday morning and it just, it really pigeonholes us. But when you think about it in the context, you see the church as a people, as a group of people, as a community, you begin to one, recognize the commitment it's going to take, but two, you have this whole new, really, like, realm of purpose that gets opened up to you because you can think outside the box. You can think outside the building. You know, you can actually even get more creative and find the, the role that you actually can play as a part of this community. So <clears throat> with that understanding, you know, of what it means to be part of a church, kind of the second main section we're going to talk about today is how to serve your church. And, uh, you know, if we each have this unique, essential role to play in the church, how do you know what your role is? How do you know what your gifts are? You know, how, how does that actually look in the context of a local church? And, uh, you know, this chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, is right when and Paul's talking about spiritual gifts. And when you talk about the topic of spiritual gifts, if you've been around the church at all for a while, uh, there's some people who are very nervous and very scared about the spiritual gifts to talk about them, don't want to bring them up. They're very weirded out by them. And then you have other people who are obsessed with them which is why the other people are weirded out by them. <laughs> and we have this weird dynamic where we can't really talk about it without being strange. And I'm not really going to dive into all the arguments surrounding spiritual gifts today. And my goal today for our time is to talk about why do they exist? Like, what are they for? And how do we actually use them for that purpose? So, so what is a spiritual gift? You know, there's, there's several lists in the New Testament of things called spiritual gifts. And you'll see things like teaching, healing, service, faith, helping, hospitality, generosity, you know, some things that you might not necessarily see as a spiritual gift, but in the places where you see them in the New Testament, the lists are actually not all identical. They're not all exactly the same. And many commentators will say that's because they're not supposed to be exhaustive. It's not a list of every spiritual gift that exists. It's more so because they're, they're illustrative of what some of these gifts are, maybe the more common ones. And while the lists change and there's different gifts that are listed, 
I'm doing like a tongue twister up here, saying gifts and listed several times. I'm going to stop that now. Um, but whenever you see that, um, the one thing that stays the same is the purpose of these gifts, what they're for. And I read a lot of definitions this past week about, you know, from parts, people way smarter than me talking about, you know, here's a concise definition of what a spiritual gift is. And, uh, and here's my, my kind of shot at like boiling it down for us so we have kind of an understanding, of a specific understanding of what it is. <clears throat> so a spiritual gift is something that the Holy Spirit has enabled you to do for the purpose of helping people become more like Jesus. So I'll say that again. A spiritual gift is something the Holy Spirit has enabled you to do for the purpose of building people up to be more like Jesus. And, uh, and just so you know, I'm not just making this up. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 is another, another passage where the Apostle Paul is talking about the same idea of, you know, the, the church being a body and about spiritual gifts. And here's what he says at the end of that, pa- that passage in Ephesians 4. This is verse 15 and 16. He says, But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. So we're to grow into Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. So you see this idea that these gifts exist to build up each other, and then you see in Ephesians what we're being built up into is to be more like Jesus. It's to be built up, it's to be more Christ-like. So we see that's the purpose of every spiritual gift. And this is helpful to understand if you're trying to figure out, well, what's my spiritual gift? You can begin by asking, is there anything you do that builds people up in this way? Is there anything you've ever done or currently doing where people give you this kind of feedback, where they're like, hey, that was really encouraging to me, the way you helped me, or what you said really built me up, it really built my faith, or it helped me see Jesus in a new light. And this definition of a spiritual gift also helps us understand the difference between like a natural ability and a spiritual gift. Because a natural ability is something that God still gave you, but he just designed you with it when he made you. Maybe you've honed it through practice and, you know, just you've kind of developed that skill, but it's just a natural ability. If you never become a Christian, you still have that. You still have that natural ability. But a spiritual gift is something that once you've become a Christian and the Holy Spirit has come into your life, it's something God has enabled you to do for this specific purpose of building people up in this way. And sometimes those go together. Sometimes you have a natural ability and a spiritual gift in the same area, and sometimes you don't. To kind of, kind of explain that, if you think through history of, like, preachers, that God has used to change people's lives, to really build people up, to build their faith, to draw them to Jesus. Some of them are amazing public speakers. You know, if they weren't a pastor, they would have been a politician, and they would have been a really good one because they could move crowds, you know, just with their ability to speak. But God also used them to build people up, so they also had the gift of teaching. And then other pastors, when you hear them talk, you, and you, you see that God has used them, but you hear them talk, and you're like, man, if he was a salesman, he would be living on the street because he cannot... He's not that interesting, or he's not a great speaker, but God still uses that person. And has, they have the gift of teaching, and they have the gift that God's using to build people up, but it's maybe not a natural talent linked to it. So all that to say, sometimes they don't go hand in hand, sometimes they do. <clears throat> so let's talk about some practical ways. We'll get real practical here about ways you can discover maybe what your spiritual gift is if you're a Christian, or ways that if you already know what your spiritual gifts are, how you can use those in the context of a local church. <clears throat> so the first thing that I would say, very, very practical. First way, if you're trying to figure out what your gifts are, is just do something. Not super groundbreaking. Not do everything, just do something. You know, get in the arena. Do something with the purpose of building someone up in this way. And, uh, you know, be committed to a local church enough to where you're actually present. You're not just, you know, attending somewhere, but you're really present within the community where you've really given yourself to that community, you've committed there. And then do something for the sake of building people up. And it doesn't have to be a formal way of doing something. You know, it's great to be a part of a Sunday morning serve team. It's great to sign up for, you know, organized serve opportunities. But it doesn't have to be that. Like, literally do something could just be invite somebody over for dinner. Help somebody with something they need help with. You know, talk to someone about Jesus. Try to encourage them. Try to encourage their faith. And as you do this, um, you'll just recognize that you're able to be so much more creative about the way you go about helping people. You know, it doesn't have to be one specific thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, in a box. It doesn't have to be all a formal way every time. And then after you've been doing something, after you've helped people, after you've served people, this is the intimidating part, Ask people to speak into your life. You know, seek feedback. Because if you say you helped somebody with something or you served in some way 
and people let you know, like, hey, that really built me up. That was really encouraging. That really made me see Jesus in a way I hadn't considered him before, and I want to be more like him now. Anything like that, that kind of feedback, you might be then discovering, you might have discovered one of your gifts if you hadn't known before. Or if you get feedback and somebody's advice, somebody says, hey, that really wasn't that helpful, you discovered that wasn't one of your gifts. You can mark it off the list. <laughs> and I know that takes a lot of humility to ask people to speak into your life like that, and it takes honesty to actually provide honest feedback. But when we recognize, like, we can have this humility when we recognize that a spiritual gift is just that. It's a gift. So when you have one, it's not really yours to brag about. And when you don't have one, it's not really yours to worry about. Like we just talked about, you're, you're essential. You're, you have a vital role to play. It might just not be the one you tried first. So really this posture of, you know, if you're not sure what your gifts are, just have a posture of seeking to build up those around you and then just pay attention to what God is doing. Now, if you already feel like you have a pretty good read on maybe what your gift is or what some of your spiritual gifts are, um, just some practical advice if you're not really sure how that plays out in your local church, some things, some things you can do. Uh, one is just make sure you've actually engaged in the community. I'm going to keep coming back to that because when you're really engaged in people's lives and really know what's going on, uh, needs are going to come up. You're going to be aware of ways you can build people up that you wouldn't be otherwise. And you might find ways to use the gifts that you already know you have. You might be able to discover new gifts through that. But first, just make sure you're actually engaged and you're not just, you know, attending on a weekly basis. But secondly, what you can do, this is, again, just very practical, is just talk to your church leaders. You know, just ask them. Say, hey, I'm here. How can I help? And if this isn't your church, if you're just visiting or you're watching online, ask your church leaders. Do the same thing. Just go to them and say, how can I help? And I can't promise there'll automatically be this light bulb moment where they have something for you right away. But what sometimes can happen is there can be needs that you're not aware of, that your church leaders are aware of, that they can link you up with. Or they might have a need that you would not regularly think was something within your realm to help with. And once you step out and try it, you find a new spiritual gift you never knew you had. So very practical, just, you know, engage in the community, talk to your church leaders. But I want to give us just a few other, you know, just a few pitfalls to be aware of in this realm uh, of spiritual gifts. This first is just the comparison game. You know, if you're, if you're reading 1 Corinthians, you can tell, like, the Corinthians had this problem where they were comparing themselves to other people, and they were feeling less than or feeling like they weren't good enough or they weren't gifted, and, and we're made of the same stuff as them. So just be aware that that's going to happen. You're going to think, hey, I want to serve, but I'm not as gifted as that person in that area, so I probably don't have that gift just because you're not as gifted. Or you can think, hey, I'm not really, my gift isn't really appreciated or isn't really popular in the church I'm a part of, so I'm not going to use it. Or I don't have the cool gift, whatever the cool gift is, you know. So just know that that's going to happen. Your brain's going to tell you those things. But what the Bible would tell you is that you're essential. You have a role to play. So, you know, don't listen to those ideas of you're not as good as, or you're not good enough, you're not a part of. <clears throat> and then secondly, the second pitfall I just want to warn us against is um, just be aware of allowing comfort to be your compass. And what I mean by that is serving people and loving people is often uncomfortable. And um, if you let comfort guide you, you're just not going to do a whole lot of it. And you're, you're going to often limit yourself. And comfort's just a terrible guide. It's just always going to lead you in a way that it's not usually going to lead you in the right way. And sometimes your gifting will line up where it's, hey, I'm pretty comfortable doing this. I like this. This is my wheelhouse. And sometimes it won't. So just be willing to step out of your comfort zone and kind of risk allowing um, yourself to find out that God gifted you in a way you didn't want. You know, that can happen to us. So just don't let, basically, the, the second pitfall is just be, beware of letting comfort guide you. It makes for a terrible guide. For, and, for, and just to give an example of that, too, just kind of explain what I'm saying, too, is if you might be somebody who has a gift where when you talk to somebody about Jesus, you can do it in a way that's winsome, makes people not feel judged, doesn't really make people feel like you're trying to like, get something from them or, or condemn them for something. And that's a real gift if you can do that. You can talk to people who are Christians and not make them feel judged. You can talk to people who aren't Christians and not make them feel judged. But using that gift, is, those conversations are often going to be uncomfortable. So just recognizing Step outside your comfort zone. Recognize that it might not always be comfortable to serve or to use the gifts God's given you. And I uh, just want to say, you know, as we're kind of closing, closing in on the, the end of the teaching here, just using our gifts is something that um, is vital to health in both your individual life, your individual walk with God, and also just as a body, as, as a local church. Because just like with your physical body, if all you do is eat and you never exercise, you're not going to be healthy. And that's the same with being part of a local church and your, your walk with God is that if all you do, if you're just fed by the word, 
you're fed by God's word and you come and you're fed, that's a good thing. But if you never exercise, it's not a recipe for health. If, if we're just a church where most of us don't really contribute to the community, we just kind of come to be inspired, that, that's not really a recipe for a healthy church, for a healthy local body. But if we're, if we're a church where we're engaged in really you know, living out, trying to figure out what it means to build each other up and really love one another as we go out into the world and show people the love that God has for them, you know, that's a recipe for, for a healthy church. Not a perfect church, not a church with no problems, but it's a recipe for, for a healthy one. And, uh, and this actually brings us to the, uh, the final idea of the whole uh, series. This is our, our kind of closing idea for this series. Uh, be, because whenever you really think through what we're talking about here, this commitment, this idea of being part of a local church, using our gifts, the question kind of, kind of, kind of comes up of, like, how do we pull that off? So what I want to talk about to close this whole series out um, is our last idea. We're just going to talk about um, the better way. The better way. And I don't know if you noticed, but at the end of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 12, um, we read what sounds kind of like a cliffhanger. Paul says, you know, desire the greater gifts, and I will show you a better way. And uh, it's not really a cliffhanger, because when you wrote it, it was a, it's a letter. He didn't write it with chapters and verses. We kind of created the cliffhanger. Um, but whenever he, what he goes into in the next chapter, after he says that, <clears throat> which if you know anything about Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 is what we call the love chapter. That's where even if you don't, really you're not familiar with the Bible, that's where you'll hear verses like what you hear at weddings all the time, which is, you know, love is patient, love is kind. And, you know, that's where we get our definition from God about what love is. But before he gets to those verses, the ones that we're more familiar with, Paul goes into this, this uh, really section where he's talking about if I just work as hard as I can and I try to use all my gifts to the best of my ability and I'm striving and I'm striving and I'm sacrificing and I'm doing my very best, but I don't have love, then it's all for nothing. And just to be clear, this isn't some tangent where he was getting away from talking about serving and he just decided to start talking about love. It wasn't a change of topic because chapters 12, 13, and 14, Paul is talking about serving and using our gifts to build people up. So it's not, love is not some tangent that he's going off on. Love is really central to what it means to serve other people. And I think it's so fitting that at the end of a series where we've been, we've been talking about all these different ways to serve, that we would end here talking about the better way, talking about love. Because if the result of this series was that, you know, 100% of people at, at Severn Covenant Church were just working really hard and striving and signed up for everything you could sign up for, and we were, it was our, in our own effort, we were just doing everything we could, but we weren't a people of love, then it would all be for nothing. And that we can't miss this, because that's, that's what Paul's getting at there. Is it's all for nothing if we're not a people of love. And that begs the question, how do we do that? You know, how do we just become a people of love? Because if you've ever tried, you can't just try really hard to be a person of love. You know, we need a brand new heart. We need a heart that's been transformed by coming in contact with a love that is greater than anything we can imagine or think up on our own. We need to actually personally come in contact with and come to know and believe the love that God has for us. That's the only thing that will transform us in this way into a people of love like this. And I'm actually going to um, let the Bible talk for itself here. <clears throat> and I'm going to read a passage out of 1 John chapter 4, verses, this is verses 7 through 21. And as I read this, I just want to ask you to, to pay attention to what this says about, first off, you know, how we become a people of love, and secondly, how we even know what love really is. So just, just pay attention to this as we read. <clears throat> Starting in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If, if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. 
He has given assurance to us from his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love, it remains in love remains in him, and God remains in him. In this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. For we are as he is in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother he has seen cannot love the God he has not seen. And we have this command from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother. <clears throat> I'm going to call up the worship team and we'll actually close down here. I know it was kind of a longer passage, but I, the word love is like in there 27 times in that, in that little passage. And uh, really the question that I have for all of us as we, as we really kind of wrap up this series about serving is just, is just this. It's, do you know this love? Have you personally come to know and to believe the love that God has for you? Because when we do, when you do actually come to know that, and as you do come to know that in larger and larger uh, quantities, is it'll change you. It'll change you into somebody who doesn't serve out of begrudging duty and doesn't serve out of fear, doesn't serve out of guilt, but actually serves out of the freedom and the joy that comes from knowing this love, knowing that God loves you this much. That's what actually transforms us into somebody who's that different. So if you do know this kind of love, I just want to say I'm super happy for you. You know, let's be the kind of people who take this love that we've experienced and just share it with the world around us any way that we can think. And that we build each other up and love each other in that way. And when we forget this love, when we feel unlovable or we feel unloving towards others, let's be a people who go back to the reason we can know we're loved this much, which is Jesus. That's why we look at Jesus each and every week, because that's where God has demonstrated his love most clearly. And if you don't know this love, I would just beg you today, just ask you today to do the same thing. Look at Jesus. Because the Bible tells us that it's not when we started serving that God started to love us or when we became part of a church in the way he wanted us to, that's whenever he started to love us. The Bible tells us that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means that while you and I were dead in our sin is whenever God decided, I'm going to demonstrate my love by dying for them. So if you don't know this love, look at Jesus. And if you do know this love, continue to look at Jesus because it's so easy for us to forget. It's this love that's the motivation for us as we serve. It's this love that is why we have hope as we serve. And it's this love that allows us to actually serve, even when it's hard and uncomfortable, but to be able to serve with a joy knowing that we're already accepted. We're not serving for God to love us. We're serving because he already does. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father, you love us uh, so much. And uh, you love us more than we can really comprehend. But God, we just ask that today uh, you would help us understand it more than we already do. If we don't understand it at all, God, help us to see it for the first time. See how beautiful your love is for us, how real it is for us. And God, if maybe we've been a Christian for years, God, I pray that just for each and every one of us, you would still just open our eyes wider, help us to understand it more, that we would understand the depth and the width and the height of your love for us. God, please change us. Please make us into a type of people who love like you love. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.